Hi right, guys, we're gonna get started then. We, like me, basically, are gonna get started. And you, um, so today I'm gonna be talking about generating real-time visuals for live performance. This is obviously very casual. This is because I have no shoes on and I'm sitting down. So don't feel bad about interrupting or asking questions if you have them. Um, and if you were here last night during the concert, I was using the same hardware setup for video and I'll be using the same stuff tonight. And the reason I wanted, I approached Val about talking about real-time visuals for live performance is because um, I obviously in the uh, demo scene, uh, a lot of people focus on doing real-time uh, routines uh, in demos and without a lot of pre-rendered uh, things. And I think that is kind of ripe for doing live performance. I don't think it's a, a big transition for people that are writing you know, extremely efficient real-time routines on a console to make them interactive and then take them out and use them for performance. So um, I perform under the name No Carrier. I use mostly um, NES consoles. I also use Commodore 64s, uh, Atari 2600s, um, and uh, you know, program for a variety of different consoles and computers, but, uh, and I use video mixers to put it all together. So, um, uh, today we're going to talk about open source live visuals because um, over the last year or so I've been increasingly um, obsessed with releasing a lot of the software that I use in performance stuff as open source and we'll talk about why. Um, software and hardware options. So if you're interested, say you already <coughs> code stuff for the NES or you code stuff for Atari 2600 or probably more likely the Commodore or Amiga, then you know what options do you have if you want to take stuff you've already written and use that to perform live? Um, we'll talk about live setup. Um, performing live, um, you know, what do you need to go out there once you get there, um, you know, what are some of the things you want to think about when you're performing, because obviously performing is a lot different than coding something that's going to be um, happening without any of your interaction whatsoever, and uh, where you can go if you want more information. The more information is mostly about NES stuff. Um, and um, open source live visuals, so again, um, you hear the term VJ thrown around a lot, um, uh, visualist, uh, you know, you might say, who cares? What's the difference? Doesn't really matter. Well, you know, VJs. Um, if you say that to an American, they probably think like, oh yeah, there's people that host like, like Carson Daly. He hosts, you know, TV shows, video countdowns. Oh, oh yeah, being a VJ would be amazing, right? So, but if you say VJ in Europe, people automatically assume that you're talking about uh, somebody that's performing, uh, usually at a at a rave, because that's where it's very common. So, um, I usually like to use the term. Uh, uh, live visuals, uh, or the term visualist, that's used a lot um, and thrown around a lot in the kind of uh, chip music community a lot. And I think it's because there isn't, you're not a VJ, you're not a video jockey. There's no video jockeying occurring in your set, right? Um, everything that you're doing is generated on, the f is generated in real time. Um, so uh, without video clips, it would be kind of a disservice to call yourself a video jockey. So again, that's where the live versus pre-rendered thing comes in. And um, I think that's an important distinction to make, especially if you're going to be performing, to let people know, hey, look, you know, I'm just not using like video clips from the Matrix up here, and you know, like adding pre-rendered filters and and you know, like spinning them around in a spastic rate, right? You're actually coding things. Um, and a lot of the stuff I release again, open source software for the NES, since I do actually have um, internet access now. Um, mm -hmm. I have a site, uh, a carrier. I go here all the time to download my software because I'm so disorganized. Um, you can too. Um, so again, over here on NES software, I have a list of things. The most recent thing I released was a open source um, multi-cart, um, which is very useful um, because there's not much stuff out there like that. Most of the time, that's what I release, the stuff that nobody else has released but should be out there um, because there's a lot of Commodore 64 stuff out there, a lot of help. You can get a lot of help doing that, but there's not a lot of people releasing open source NES software. Some of the things we'll talk about today, uh, one of them is Glitch NES. We'll get to this in a minute. This is something I wrote uh, a couple years ago that does, um, it makes effects similar to what you think of of circuit bending, which is really popular, but it's all RAM corruption via software. So um, this has been pretty popular. I think it's because people like to make things that look glitchy. <laughs> I didn't think it would be that popular when I released it, actually, because um, <laughs> it's ridiculously simple code. Um, but anyway, we'll uh, talk about some of that now, but all this is open source, and you can grab it. And um, again, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Glitch Nest. This is a screenshot, which looks even worse um, on, uh, with, the, with this projector, and especially with a nice forest background from this presentation. Uh, and again, glitchness, what it does, uh, the right things at the wrong times. So what I mean is it's updating the screen, it's writing to the memory, it's doing all of this stuff, but it's doing it at the wrong time. So it's writing to the screen when it's rendering, 
Okay, that's obviously not a good idea. All right, but it produces some interesting effects. But <coughs> if you do it and you don't get too crazy, you just corrupt the video RAM and the program will still continue to run. So you have control over it. How you can use it live. A lot of people use it as a background layer for live visuals because it's very um, colorful. It provides a very staticky look and it's a glitchy look. A lot of people that like um, maybe more aggressive chip music might use that as a uh, background layer. And I'll show some uh, software at the end. So again, um, this is just one thing I released. Uh, another one was Logoness. And uh, again, you can see I'm not really good at naming these things. Um, this is used for, it displays full screen images that can be scrolled or color cycled. So the idea here is to provide a basis for a foreground layer if you want to do visuals live um, and you want to have maybe an 8-bit um, kind of feel to the graphics but you don't do a lot of coding yourself. Well then you can use this and the included tools to make logos that you can color cycle and scroll on the screen to uh, use in performances. You might want to use that to key it over other layers and we'll talk uh, more about that in a moment. So again, um, there's already some tools out there and a lot of these are relatively simple, could be combined to make a lot uh, better ones and I keep releasing software hoping someone's going to make some amazing modifications and then get back to me about it. Andrew's pretty much the only person that ever wrote, has ever actually looked at any of my source code and done anything with it. But, um, you know, if I keep releasing open source software, maybe somebody will actually look at it. Maybe especially if I stop including batch files that compiles it. That would definitely, that would probably, maybe that's something I should think about. Um, but again, um, we're gonna, I'll show you uh, more about the hardware later. But first, software and hardware options. If you are interested in the NES, for instance, what do you do? Um, you can make your own development cartridges, or you can use one of these, this changed my life, uh, the Retro USB Power Pack. So this is actually a compact flash-based NES cart, so you can put ROMs on it, and then just pop them in here. And before that, I had to go out to gigs and limit the amount that I drank, because I have to switch EEPROMs all the time in cartridges, and it was a real pain in the ass to, you know, be in a dark bar, crowded, drunk, and have to switch EEPROMs in and out. But now I can drink a lot more, because this is a menu, so as long as I can still, <laughs> if I can drink enough so I can still read, then I have no problems because I can read the menu. So that's great. Um, so here the first option is going to be, if you want to use an NES, would be a development cart. And as you can kind of see in the upper right here, this is a copy of a gyromite cart where you literally cut a hole in the front, um, rip out, uh, desolder the old EEPROMs, and you can solder new ones in. Um, the benefits of this, it's really easy to switch out the chips. You can also buy a, uh, these red boards in the lower left. These are sold on RetroUSB.com. Um, they make blank development cartridges, which is great. Um, you could solder some sockets in there and really do have a really quick dev cycle on uh, turnaround time on real hardware. It's fun to assemble them. Um, you learn a lot about the hardware. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the real benefits. And they're cheap, right? They're cheap. And uh, for example, um, if you ever want to lend one to your friend, it's not like a $150 flash cart. You can just make a development cartridge quick and uh, let someone borrow it. So. And that's the other thing too, is that you know, even with uh, one Commodore 64, one Nintendo hooked up to a projector, if you have some software that you wrote, you can do video with just one. You don't need an expansive setup, a big mixer. If you have a program that you write for the Commodore that has a lot of subroutines, different graphics, then you, know, you can really get a, stretch those things a long way. Um, the power pack is the next thing. Uh, the benefits, it's easy to change tile sets, right? This is, I mean, if you're editing graphics and you're, you can swap out things really quickly. You can make multiple copies of the same program with different effects. So if you just want to tweak your code and make different copies, you don't have to burn EEPROMs every time. The challenge is uh, there's an FPGA in here and uh, you know it looks different than the dev cart in emulation. So I mean it is almost an emulator in here. It does support you know uh, chips that it doesn't have on here through emulation. So um, it is going to look a little bit different but it is really pretty accurate. Most people would never know the difference. Um, last is emulation, right? Um, there's a lot of people that do video with 8-bit video on their computer using emulators. Uh, the benefits there, of course, it's easy to change child sets, make multiple copies of different programs. The challenge is, again, different emulators provide different results. I'm sure if you do any coding for any type of hardware, you know that you want to, before you test it on a you want to test it on a real thing because eventually you're going to have some discrepancies between emulators and um, what it really looks like. Um, so live setup. Um, this is where you guys are welcome to come up and take a look at this stuff if you want. Um, this is the Edderall V4 here. That's what you see over there. This is a really sturdy video mixer. 
um, it's used to mix between different video inputs. So um, if you want to take a look up here in the front, this is something I used last night. This is a ripped and edited uh, background from uh, a video game Metal Storm, as you called out in like three yes. seconds, Mike. <laughs> All right, so um, if we have this, great, this is one channel. Um, I want to switch to another channel. You know, I have uh, this um, program here that I wrote here, which has uh, moving background images, um, you know, and independently moving sprite layer, kind of like a star field. So um, for a live setup, you know, when you're working with 8-bit hardware, especially the Commodore, there's going to be some limitations. There's going to be limitations, right? You're going to have so many colors. You can only have, um, you know, uh, so many sprites. Well, <laughs> depending on, on the console, you're going to be faced with different limitations. So if I wanted to mix this with this, well, those green squares in the background are already a background layer. That whole thing is already a background layer. So, of course, uh, the mixer allows you to uh, do chroma keying. And, you know, with a relatively simple effect like Chroma King, you can come up with something that adds a lot more depth. And um, if we add uh, this moving here, and we add this layer moving against it, you can see how much more uh, appealing that looks than just this or just this. And one of the big benefits of this is that um, if you look at the green squares, um, this is why I hate video and working with video, is this is a completely clean Chroma Key. So that black is black. That black isn't gr sh gradient shades of crappy compressed black in an AVI file. So that's a huge thing. Chroma King, you'd never be able to get that clean break that you'd be able to get with um, Chroma King with 8-bit stuff. So I think that's definitely appeal. I'm sure a big appeal. I'm sure a lot for a lot of you too that have coded for older consoles. You know that um, you know you see every pixel of that 256 by 240 resolution and you can chroma key it seamlessly. So um, again, so for a live setup, um, uh, use a mixer to mix between video inputs. Uh, you want a monitor. If you saw me staring like this yesterday, it's just a really small color video monitor. If you've ever DJed before, you know the DJs need headphones to hear the track that they're mixing in. Same thing with a video monitor. Uh, video monitor allows you to preview something before you're mixing it in. And this video mixer will allow you to see one channel, two channels, the output, and that allows you to preview what's coming in. So that's why there's four Nintendos up here. There's only two in at any one time, but you want to have more copies of your software queued up on multiple systems. So I would think for performance, at the very least, you want three inputs. Two inputs at any one time to keep it fresh. Another input if something crashes <laughs> to mix in real quick. Um, so there are those type of concerns. So it's not overkill. It's not this like weird gear fetish that I have. Well, I do have, um, but that's not why this stuff's up here. <laughs> uh, it's because you definitely, uh, the more copy, uh, not the, the more uh, hardware, the better um, when mixing. Um, again, hardware, cons uh, consoles, concerns with older parts, that's huge, right? Um, uh, these Nintendos have had their internal 72-pin connectors replaced. Um, I also use third-party modern AC adapters. And one of the reasons you do that is because if I take this stuff, say, somewhere further than at party, um, you know, do some gigs abroad, you don't want this stuff breaking in another country. Especially if you, you especially don't want an NTSC machine breaking in a PAL country, right? And when all your software is written in NTSC and that it, taking advantage of, uh, you know, the specifics of the hardware. So that's just one concern um, when you're performing live. It's not like a demo party where you get to set everything up and, well, and everything works, ha ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's not like where you have all, control over everything. Like I said, you're at a bar, you're, it's stuffed, you're probably drinking. Um, and if something doesn't work, you want to have a backup plan. So make sure you plan ahead. I take extra connectors with me at gigs in case I ever need to screw the, uh, add, take a pop it off and stick a screwdriver in. One of these, yeah, this one doesn't even have the top screwed on anymore for that same reason. So I can access the inside if uh, something's going wrong. <laughs> And um, computers, right? There are concerns with outputs. So if you do want to get into live video, think about your outputs. If you are going to go the video route, like say, well, I want to do emulation at first. I read a lot of Commodore software, but screw taking that thing around. Vice is more, is better, runs things better than my actual Commodore, right? So if you want to take that out, just make sure this has S video and composite inputs. That's what most video mixers have. Usually, if you're going to show up at a party with just a VGA input, that means you're going right into the projector. That's not always good if you're performing on stage and the projector is a couple hundred feet behind you mounted on the ceiling. So sometimes they'll only have S-Video and composite run. So you always want to make sure that if you're going out to gigs, you come prepared with all the outputs, everything you need. Um, because 
unlike musicians, like Mike has this expansive setup here for uh, just, for the just four performers here, a great mixing board. Most people, most sound guys, know nothing about video. Most, not not saying you, not you. Uh, <laughs> most of them know nothing about video, or don't care, or both. Right? So it's like we got a projector here, man. They do shows here sometimes with it. That's all that you hear, and then you're on your own. So you want to make sure you come over prepared with stuff to fix your hardware for breaks, and definitely stuff to hook up. Um, if you're thinking about buying a projector, resolution, brightness, and throw are very important. If you're going to be doing a lot of 8-bit video, mostly brightness and throw. Contrast is also huge, right? Resolution, great. It does 1920 by 9 million. It doesn't matter. You're outputting 256 by 240. Okay. I had a really bright 800 by 600 projector with great contrast, and it threw huge images, and I it was perfect. So again, um, if, you're, if you're thinking about doing primarily 8-bit video or low-res stuff, don't get hung up on some of the details of the projector. You're looking for mostly brightness, throw, and contrast. You want things to be popping and looking really good. Um, so putting it all together, these are two pictures of my setup, but I mean, the setup is pretty identical to what you see here. Um, so I'll do a quick uh, demo. Um, of course, Mike just stepped out. We'll get him to come in and put some music on. Maybe he has it playing. No. All right, it's okay. I can get a Sid playing real quick. Um, let me see. Yeah, he has some queued up here. Uh, oh, he even has that Jammer, not a jazz one. That's who did it, Jammer. That song is so good. And uh, it's not playing. Hold on. Uh-oh, I better wait him to come back. I see something out here that says no, no, no on a piece of tape, so I'm not going to go near this anymore. <laughs> That's not near what I was touching, but I got frightened me enough to stop. Anyway, so again, um, let's wait until he gets back. Um, I'll do a quick demo. There's a couple things you want to keep in mind. So if you code demos, one thing I love about the demo scene is I love watching demos that are synchronized to music. We're like, not like a music visualizer, but I mean that certain parts of the song, the demo changes. Like, oh, we're going from part A of the demo to part B of the demo in time with the music. Not like, not like these cubes are bouncing with the drum hits, you know, not something like that. So keep the musician in mind. You don't want to make it seem like when you're doing video that you're trying to take away from what the musician's doing. That's like the worst thing. I see people that perform all the time and they're really excited about performing and then they get up there and they do their own thing and it doesn't matter. It, it's almost like it didn't matter if there was a musician up there, right? They would do the same thing no matter what. And I think that's kind of bad because musicians hopefully don't go up there and just do the same thing no matter what. They have some idea of the audience, their surrounding, the type of show. So video should be the same. Um, I think you should take it just as serious and keep your, the musician in mind. And with that, like I said, beat matching and counting. Um, if I could get this song. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. Uh, it's playing. Ooh. Hear it. That is the song. That's well, just the sub. Though. That's just the sub. <laughs> that makes it better. Yeah, that's all we need. Yeah, How about beat sub. matching and counting? You can count bass. Wait. There we go. There you go. So, um, beat matching and counting, right? Um, you know, saying, uh, for example, let's pull up these two videos last night. So like I said, um, you want to kind of keep the musician in mind and count off. One of the best things if you want to start doing live video is to, if you've never DJed before, it's a real help. If you've been a DJ, a lot, a lot of VJs I know or visualists have been DJs first. If you understand strong structure and just and can count <laughs> and have some feeling, it can make it a lot easier. And even doing things as simple as um, Mike, it worked, I think. So, counting and then moving things opposite each other in time could really make it great for the viewer. Because, for example, we're going to be looking at Carl tonight when he's playing right here. And if you're already focused on a musician, you're going to be paying attention to what's going on in the background, but you'll be paying attention to it a lot more if it's synchronized with music. And it's almost like a, um, you know, an unconscious thing. But if you can synchronize it, just leave things in your software. Think about it when you're coding. Can I change a palette by one button press? Can I change the direction of a star field by one button press? And if I can, then I can do it in time to music. And it requires a lot of interaction on your part, but it's going to really complete the experience for the viewer, the concert attendee, and really kind of tie it all together. So again, 
keep the musician in mind, count off, try to make sure that you're synchronizing because it's gonna make it, um, I guarantee you it'll make it uh, better for the people watching and um, it won't seem like you're competing. You know, working with a musician I think is really key. Um, mixing versus chroma keying. Again, that's one thing you wanna keep in mind. Um, I know this sounds trivial, but okay. So this is mixing. That looks crappy, right? Like it's literally going from one to the other. Chroma keying is what you always wanna do. I mean, it sounds stupid, but if you've never worked with video before, chroma keying is probably uh, what you wanna stick with. So make sure if you're buying a mixer, a video mixer that has um, a variety of different chroma key options. Some of them like this one allows you to dial in the color that you want a chroma key, uh, which is great for if you're work, maybe performing with other people and there's a lot of blue in the background. Well then you can cut that blue out. Right now I have it set to black. So again, buying a mixer that will be versatile and allow you to work in different situations is one thing you want to think of. Effects. Uh, mixing or coding your own. So, um, for example, again, this thing right here. Uh, this is just uh, a simple effect, but if I want to mirror this, I can mirror it with one touch of the uh, button and I can change the amount of mirroring. So what I'm getting here are effects for free. And in an 8-bit environment where you're writing all the software, think about it. Do I really want to write something to split the screen and mirror it a different way? Do I want to write that routine or is that something that the mixer can do? And another great thing, again, that I think about low-res visuals are that you have these seamless type of mirroring that looks good because, um, again, you don't have any crappy artifacts. So again, um, mirroring like this, that's a completely different look to it, especially when you start talking about uh, moving different directions. So you can get something that looks completely different uh, with all hardware-based mixer effects with your software literally being the same. So again, um, when you're looking at hardware, think about the mixer, because if you don't want to be coding effects all the time, it's probably a good idea <laughs> to grab something like that. Um, layering, like I said, my background layer has more color in it, um, and uh, my background layer has more color in it here, and uh, Castlevania one, uh, and uh, some of these don't work, of course, that's great to show those in a performance, uh, uh, Mega Man, as you know. So some of these have more color in them, where this has a lot more black, so um, that's because, of course, again, back to the idea of chroma keying. So think about your software. If you're arranging it for live performance, what's going to be a background layer, what's going to be a foreground layer, just don't attack it all at one time. Um, more information and then um, any questions or anything like that uh, we can take. Uh, my website, email address, Twitter, and I work with playpower.org. So um, the reason I say that is they're a uh, group working with bringing low-cost um, learning games in developing countries. And like, why am I involved in that? Because it turns out the first computer that they're working with is a clone of the 6502 <laughs> chip that's in the NES. So um, I've done a lot of NES coding tutorials uh, for them. If you're interested in video, a lot of it centers around there. And if you go to their, their website and look on their wiki, you can um, find some information. There's a Nestev bulletin board um, that's very useful as well um, if you want to get into this type of coding. Um, and uh, of course, some of the software I use, but again, this is more for the NES side of things than the live uh, video performance stuff. So, are there any questions about hardware setup or anything in general? Carl, I feel bad calling your name. You're like, yeah, it makes it sounds like only my friends are here. Yes, Carl. <laughs> What's like the time it takes to code? Just like say the the cube sequence. Well, okay, that's cool. So yeah, so this is I try to get the most out of everything I code, right? So. This is an interesting because it has, like again, a star field that can go different directions. It's got a uh, foreground, a background that can go different directions. But then make it selectable, right? Build in some extra stuff, like clouds, right? So now you have clouds. You can change it to like stars, and then you have something different, right? So um, and again, all that's mapped to this. I have a, um, you know, one thing you want to really think of. I have a NES Advantage. The reason I use the NES Advantage is because it has a switch, and that way you can use two controllers with one controller. So that's really useful, right? To, to more, double the buttons, and um, I have one controller in the foreground, the other controller controls the background. So um, to answer your question, I guess, to take, writing software takes different amounts of time, obviously, depending on how complex it is. But I think the key is not getting hung up on writing software that only does one thing. 
So if you can write software, if you have a good idea, try to squeeze the most out of it by having that software be easy to put more tiles in, different textures in, that type of thing, I guess. So, but I mean, yeah, I can't, I, how long is kind of a hard question, I'm sorry. What's Why do you up? pick the Nintendo graphic versus doing it on the computer? Um, well, that's, uh, well, I started going to chip music shows. And I would go to chip shows, and I saw like great Game Boy musicians, and then there was like, like I said, guys using like Modulate behind them, like a very popular VJ software. And they're back there. There's people up there with Game Boys playing great Apeit music. You know, it's, and I love that sound. And then I see like, you know, clips from like, you know, like Blade Runner and like Pulp Fiction being mixed in the background because they're just VJs and they do video, and they're like. You know, and their friends like, well, we want somebody to do video, and oh, it's Game Boy. Let's find a guy who mixes sci-fi movies. But it, you know, so I wanted to. I thought that like, uh, eight-bit hardware would be a good match to eight-bit music. You know, and there weren't many people doing uh, when I started doing this. There weren't many people doing video on real hardware, and I just figured that it would definitely like, like I said, complete the experience for the viewer, and uh, you know, as very similar aesthetic uh, to the music. So, and. Uh, I would kind of regret it now, trying to take all this stuff through customs sometimes. <laughs> Thinking like for Nintendos and a video mixer to other countries is always fun. I don't know if they think I'm like, I have no idea what they think. But uh, <laughs> no, it's, it is fun. And um, you know, I'll tell you, um, I've never been more scared in my life than running, doing video on a laptop. Because I've had, I did video on a Windows laptop and that cra it crashed, you know, and then like, uh, it's crashed, uh, you know, and, and even but the the MacBook's been a little bit better. But you know what? Um, there's been a lot of people think, oh, well, don't these break down? They're pretty sturdy, you know. I mean, I stack these things on top of each other, and they're plugged in for eight, ten hours sometimes. There's no problem. So uh, it's worked out. Did you use that power glove? No, I've never used the power glove. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> you want to borrow mine for tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'd be pretty you serious. Borrow <laughs> power glove. It's, it's, yeah, I'm glad you brought it though. I'm glad you know you brought it here. I brought two. You brought two of them. That's even better. Maybe we can both use one. Um, cool. Um, any other questions? No. Um, how did you get the background images? Sorry, if this is a stupid question. Did those? You just, yeah. I made those. I just did those. So, um, yeah. I mean, those clouds are just a couple different tiles, you know. Um, I think uh, those. That's were from Ducktales. <laughs> those backgrounds. I mean, some yeah. things I ripped. Those I just drew. Drew, you know, so some of these, but then like this one, not that one, this one here, like this stuff, this is really neat. Um, Andrew uh, and I were working a lot on NES software recently, and um, FCE UX, a popular emulator, and there might be, uh, has a debugger function where you can dump the PPU memory. So you can dump the current graphics bank and all of the tiles and where they're placed. So you can imagine how fun that is. And then I opened this up in a s software, and I stripped out all the health bars and made it loop seamlessly, so that way I could use it for like performance. So yeah, I mean, I think that it, I, most of the stuff, uh, like you'll see, most, a lot of my stuff is kind of geometric and fast-paced and stuff I've drawn, but I do kind of like mixing in abstract stuff uh, as well from some because this is great looking, you know, and I wouldn't want to draw that. So yeah, so yeah, I think it's a mix of most of the stuff I do I draw, but some of the stuff I was ripped too. Have you ever been doing a performance and your hardware, like, sort of, you know, I don't know if like a Nintendo can sort of half crash but still keep on chugging along. And yeah. I'm wondering if you've ever just, like, mixed that into the, like... Totally. <laughs> totally have. Because sometimes, like, yeah, because, yeah, sometimes that definitely happens. Like, if they get bumped or something, sometimes it looks really glitchy. And like I said, um, some of the software I have, let me see if I can pull one up. This is, actually, I should show you this. This is the actual Power Pack menu. I was saying the flash cart, so it's great. Like, there's just an entire folder here. But um, I do have some like, like, like this actually started out, that uh, glitch software that I wrote started out as this, right? Uh, it was a problem that I made, I, I messed up with something and I kept this running. And this is just really bad video corruption. And if we could slow it down, you can see what it looks like. And that's nice, the mixer can actually slow down things too, which is cool. Um, it's missing frames, but that um, kind of glitchy software, which is a lot cleaner looking than this, yeah, sometimes, yeah, uh, uh, mistakes I've made I end up using, and sometimes you, yeah, if you bump the NES, or especially with this flash cart, things go wrong, yeah, sometimes I just kind of let it ride, especially if I uh, don't notice, <laughs> <laughs> which just happens sometimes too. But yeah, so like, I mean, you can do a lot of, uh, you know, there are some unintended uh, mistakes that end up working out, totally, you know, so, uh, and yeah, I, this I use frequently as a kind of a background layer. 
for mixing in over top of other stuff. Because nice. you can see, it, it doesn't look too bad, right? So, um, yeah, it kind of gives a neat effect. And uh, again, like I said, never, I can't ever, un, un, ever tell you how much you shouldn't underestimate the onboard effects. A simple rig of reverse chroma key like that is really awesome. And that's just one button press. And, uh, you know, back again. So whatever you can get for free, like that slow, like that's kind of too fast for given the foreground. But slow that glitchy part down and you have something that looks kind of good. Even down here, even you can slow it down even more. And uh, yeah, so definitely look into a good mixer if you want to start doing live video because the effects that come for free can really help uh, save you time with coding. Cool. Thank you guys for uh, coming out and listening. And uh, well, if, please come up tonight. Oh, thank you. Please come up tonight during the performance if you want to check this stuff out, right? Because like Carl will be. Um, uh, playing and uh, Citrix will be playing later. So if you haven't, if you're interested in it, please come on up. And uh, while I'm playing, you can take a look over my shoulder. And uh, I won't be flustered. I'll be sober. So, <laughs> and so uh, no, please come on up and take a look if you if you have any questions or want to know more or hit me up on the internet.